The appeal of a shopping mall varies from person to person. And I think it's fair to say that it's influenced by a person's age and by the era itself. The youth who frequent a local mall today are going to experience a vastly different place than those who were young adults in the 80s, 90s, even the early 2000s. The era of the smartphone has really changed the world. More so than the physical device itself, it's the interconnectivity and availability of everything. In the 1990s, the internet and the very concept of being online, it wasn't really a thing for most people. The internet existed, sure, but going online was something to be done at a destination while sitting in a computer. The world outside of that online experience, it filled the gaps which, for better or for worse, exist on a smartphone today. Shopping, connecting with friends, going out for food or drinks, sometimes at an internet cafe, and not least of all, gaming were all things you did at a destination. Back in the day, home computer games were fairly rudimentary. Rusty, please do not eat the truckster. And so were arcade games. But the gap between what you'd find on your television set and what you'd find in a physical arcade was quite vast. Far more so than modern times, to be sure. Oftentimes, it was the arcade that showcased each step forward in the latest and greatest gaming technology. All with one idea in mind getting more quarters out of your pockets. It wasn't just what you saw on the screen either. Arcade cabinets were often equipped with whirly gigs and doodads in efforts to make the experience more immersive. Games like Sega's Afterburner is a prime example. This fighter pilot simulator added motion into the mix. The deluxe version of this arcade cabinet rocked players back and forth to emulate the feeling of their F-14 climbing and dropping as they shot down enemy aircraft. But. Five years before Sega's cabinet was setting records in mall arcades and movie theater lobbies, inventor John Sasek was introducing his own attempt at a hybrid ride slash video game. He was a lifelong inventor, with one of his creations being a toy alligator on a leash. One day, while walking through a department store, he saw a vacuum cleaner sales pitch. The salesperson was floating a beach ball, suspended on air, blowing from the appliance. That was all the inspiration he needed to develop his most famous creation. The Saker One Space Probe. Okay, so maybe it wasn't that famous. His idea? A spherical video game cabinet floating on a jet stream of air. Riders would sit inside the ball, in front of a bank of buttons and joysticks. The aim was that the player controls would affect two aspects of the experience. The first being the directional flow of air, rising up through the ride's oversized cylinder component the base of which housed a 30 horsepower turbine, pushing winds of up to 140 miles per hour through the cylinder. This would raise the sphere up on a stream of air, with the aforementioned controls directing the flow of that air, and in turn, rotating the sphere. Honestly, a pretty cool experience on its own. But the joysticks and buttons would also control a video game. Presented on a CRT monitor inside the sphere, Early presentations of the space probe showcased a game experience similar to something out of Star Wars. So similar, in fact, that it was Star Wars. Sasek had simply presented his invention using VHS footage from the George Lucas feature film. After lawyers uttered the word infringement, it was quickly removed and reportedly replaced with an Atari 2600 game. After this, Sasek apparently approached George Lucas himself with a movie idea of his own where a young boy flies his Seeker 1 space probe into outer space, only to have an adventure in the struggle to get it back home. But much like the big comfy couch video game for the Sega Genesis, it never happened. Technically speaking, the Seeker 1 space probe was an expensive development, and each game cost between $38,000 and $70,000 to build. Accounting for inflation, that would be between $100,000 and $200,000 today. And Sasek's plan was for the machines to be leased to arcades and nightclubs, for some reason, at a rate of $2,500 per month. That's the equivalent of roughly $7,500 a month today. The Space Probe's very first installation was at a nightclub which Sasek himself owned, and he reported long lines of people who were willing to pay $2 for a two-minute ride in the probe. At that rate, if you were an arcade owner planning to lease a Space Probe at $2,500 per month, you'd need to count on selling 42 rides every single day just to break even. And that's without paying for a full-time ride attendant, 
which, if you were actually planning on operating a space probe, was required. So when you do the math, the cost prohibitiveness of the space probe was reason enough as to why not many of these were actually ever seen in the wild, especially considering you could lease a Pac-Man machine for a couple hundred bucks. Despite all of this, however, there were a couple of notable installations. This photo shows Sasek delivering a space probe to the Kennedy Space Center, where it was said to have been considered to be used for astronaut training. No word on if it was successfully implemented as part of the astronauts' regimen, however. The space probe's other notable implementation is what brought it to my attention. This early concept art for West Edmonton Mall's Fantasyland expansion in 1985 was obviously heavily influenced by the space probe. Years before the park was rethemed into Galaxyland, park planners already had an outer space theme in mind for the expansion of the park. This original concept art may have proven to be an overly ambitious take, but many pieces shown here did actually make it into the park itself. The overhead looping coaster became the Mindbender, which operated in the park for 37 years before being removed just this past year. Astro Base Alpha, which was a tilt-a-whirl based shooting gallery, operated for a time in the park as well. But perhaps no ride from this concept art was more exaggerated than Sasek's Space Probe. Except for maybe the Fantasyland nightclub, sitting up there like something out of the Jetsons. The concept shows multiple spheres floating high in the air, far beyond what would have been possible on the ride itself. This proposed implementation looks like it was based on a sales pitch versus what was actually doable in real life. I suppose we can give this a pass though. We all know that concept art rarely resembles reality. It's what makes concept art so fun, letting the imagination run wild. The idea for what was then known as Canada Fantasyland second phase was that there would be a fleet of space probes in which riders would do battle with each other. Players would climb into their respective spheres and a sophisticated computer system was intended to connect the entire fleet together to do battle. Certainly within the realm of technology in 2023, but not so much in 1983. So in the end, when West Empton Mall's amusement park expanded with no space theme at all, it had only acquired a single space probe and Fantasyland Sphere was equipped without any type of internal video game or usable controls. Because of this, the ride was modified to simply have the operator bounce the sphere up and down in its tube. Riders experienced the feeling that one might fly right out of the tube, even though it wasn't possible. After a few bounces up and down, the ride would end and repeat riders would be few and far between. Pair that with reported constant maintenance issues, specifically with the blower motor, and the space probe's tenure at the park didn't last long. There's no confirmed date on record of its removal, but it was within the first few years of its implementation. Beyond this, the story of the Saker 1 space probe pretty much ends. In the years after what we've just spoken about, there are no other mentions of this ride on record. Today, its legacy lives on as a mere fleeting curiosity in the world of video games. Just another in a long list of ambitious, but seemingly unfeasible pieces of amusement technology. Virtually no establishment could afford it. No establishment had a demand for it. And for all intents and purposes, it never shipped with its own video game experience. A bouncing ball with an Atari 2600 and television screens strapped inside along with you. Yet, Despite all the barriers to its existence, for a small blink in time, it was very much a thing. And I think that's what made the 80s and 90s eras so great. It didn't matter how little something made sense, like a mall with submarines in it. If it sounded cool, that was enough to build a thing. And what a fun little thing it was. The Saker One Space Probe. Do you have a favorite novelty arcade game? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel, give us a like and a share, and maybe even visit our Patreon page. And why not check out one of our other videos, mostly about the greatest indoor show on earth, West Edmonton Mall. Oh, and thanks for watching.